So thank you for coming. It's lovely to see you. Um, I'm Margaret Carhill and um, this is my book, Under Cover of Darkness, How I Blogged My Way Through Mantle Cell Lymphoma. Um, I'm not going to talk very much about cancer, but I want to talk about the process of how blogging turned into something much more for me than just writing about what was going on in my life. Um, it's all quite unexpected and I just wanted to share with you the journey through which it unfolded because I think it's very relevant to all of us these days. So, um, the irony of, of the whole thing it hasn't escaped me. I'm actually a publisher myself, um, and I'm used to dealing with other people's words. So, it was very strange to be in a situation where I was doing the writing and other people wanted to read my words. And that was all a very scary place to be because I'm, I'm used to sitting, you know, hiding, you know, in my office behind the telephones and everything. Um, so actually writing was a really big step for me, um, especially on something like this. You, you don't expect to find a voice through an experience like cancer. Um, when I was first diagnosed, obviously we all felt as, as though we'd been hit by a brick. Everybody always does. And um, there's the people that love you, obviously they want to have all the latest updates, they want to know what's the latest and when are you having this treatment and have you had a blood test and you know what's happening with all the scans and everything and we found that we were spending every minute of every day and the evening emailing people or talking to people or texting people or and it was exhausting and we were really really fed up of the big C word you know like that program the other week you think I just don't want to talk about this anymore so um, we got a text one, one evening um, from a friend who, it was very late and he was obviously very emotional um, and he, he was very upset and he'd been missed out of the loop, he's a very dear friend and he'd been missed out of the loop and he hadn't had the latest update and he said no, it, it, on the text he said no, it, it's okay. Um, you don't have to keep me in contact all the time and I'll find out from somebody else, but I'm here for you. And it was very clearly a, a kind of somebody who was very upset and somebody who was very dear to Stephen and I. So I was talking to uh, one of my authors the next day about this um, and she said, well, why don't you start a blog? And I said, what, me, right? I don't do that, you know. <laughs> um, she said, no, really you can start a blog, just start a really easy blog and you can keep in contact with people that way and you can, both you and Stephen, because it, by that stage it, we realised that we actually knew a lot of people between us and she said you can just point everybody to the blog and then you don't have to keep repeating it. So I leapt into the technology, I'm not the most um, technologically advanced person so I, there's a lot of swearing going on and um, I, I leapt into technology and I created margaretcarhill.wordpress.com. So the first blog was really a kind of a, like, whoa, here I am, and this is what's going on, and this is why I'm doing this blog, just to keep people up to date. Um, and it went to quite a few people, and we were really astounded by the response. It was, it was really lovely. Um, at the time, I, I was just starting, I think I'd done two blogs, and um, they were very kind of chatty, sort of newsy kind of things. And then I went in for the first cycle of chemotherapy, and, and that's when it really hit me. The shock really hit me. The toxins, the, the poison, the whole thought of what I was going through really hit me. And I'd taken um, a journal in because I knew from um, courses and everything that, you know, it was good to do a spiritual journal, good to keep a spiritual journal, get this stuff out, write it all down. So I did that. Um, and for the first, I think I was in for five nights for the first cycle. And for the first couple of the first couple of nights, I get my journal out and I start writing all the vicious, angry, hurt, why me thoughts and I'd be sobbing as I was doing it I'd be I was so full of anger like why did this have to happen to us now you know we we just got our lives together and we just recently met and like why us why this why now um, and so I, I finished writing it and I put it away and then had more chemo the next day and got the journal out the next night and of course I couldn't stop reading what I'd written the night before and I thought 
whoa, that's a bit, you know, <laughs> negative. But I wrote some more. Um, and this went on for a couple of days. And then I realised that I felt as if I was putting the journal away and it was just all those thoughts, they were just kind of festering there. They say that you shouldn't read this stuff back, but everybody does. You know, you can't resist it, it's human nature. Um, and so I was writing another blog and I thought, well, you know, maybe I'm going to say a little bit more about what's going on because people were saying, well, how are you coping with this? And, you know, are you fighting it or how does it feel with the chemo and, you know, what's going on? So I started sharing a lot more of how I actually felt um, and the results that came back were absolutely amazing. The more I opened up, the more people opened up to me. And um, one, of the, one of the things that I, I shared was, um, I think it was the third or fourth blog, was this completely crazy dash across the countryside where um, I'd had my radioactive injection at Southampton. They then told me that the scanner wasn't actually working. Um, so I'm sitting there full of radioactivity, shouldn't have anybody anywhere near me whatsoever. And she came in and said, well, um, the scanner isn't working. And I sort of looked at myself. I wasn't glowing, but I thought I was glowing. And so I sort of looked at myself and said, well, so what happens now then? And she said, um, we're not quite sure. <laughs> I thought, well, thanks for that. You know, <laughs> I'm full of radioactivity. The scanner's broken, you know. And I said, well, can't I drive somewhere? Can't I go somewhere else? Um, and she said, yes, well, there's a scanner at Portsmouth, which is about another hour further on. And I didn't know the way. And I was on my own. And I didn't have sat-nav. So I said, OK, yeah, I'll do it. You know, let's just go for it. Because by this stage, I knew I was writing the blog. And it was becoming something in my mind. It was keeping me sane. It was something that I could... I knew I was going to relate. It was almost like to my readership, you know, um, which sounds really kind of weird. But... That's the way it felt, and it was almost as though I was an observer and I was remembering what was going on and I was noticing what people said so that I could relay it later. And there was a really small part of me that was kind of enjoying it because I thought, I've actually got something to write about now. So anyway, I did this madcap dash. I got lost going out of Southampton and had to shout at somebody across the road to get directions because I'd been told not to get near anybody. Um, so I managed to get to Portsmouth and managed to have the scan and then came back and, you know, that took a whole day. Um, and I realised how much I enjoyed writing about it on the blog. Um, I also was incredibly lucky to have um, a consultant who fully endorsed what I wanted to do. Um, I, at the beginning, when I got the diagnosis for mantle cell lymphoma, it was made very clear to me that this was a non-negotiable kind of cancer. Um, I wanted to go off to India for six weeks to go and have a complete detox. And he said, um, Joe said, if it was any other kind of cancer, I'd say, yes, go for it. You know, it'll probably do you good and you might actually cure it. But he said to us, you can't. With this kind of cancer, if there's one cell left, then it'll come back and we won't be able to treat you at all. You know, you, you have to have all the chemo and you can't stop it. But he was from Kerala and so he understood completely about Ayurveda and he was totally on our side. And he said, whatever you want to take, it's fantastic. You know, just tell me about it and take everything that you want and, you know, do it. Keep yourself and I'm going to do Ayurveda at all as well. And the blog just went crazy, all these people came on and said, but does your consultant agree with that? And, and suddenly I was getting contacted by people all around the world who was, were facing the same fight, you know, that, that they didn't want to have to choose between complementary therapies and conventional medicine. And here was me giving this chance with this amazing consultant who was saying, yes, go for it. So I, I felt as if I was supported in all areas because he was supporting me, I'd got fantastic family around me and I'd got this increasing readership on the blog um, where I could relay all this stuff and other sufferers of mantle cell lymphoma also got in touch and started. we all started sharing which therapists we were seeing, which herbalists um, and, and I was getting braver and braver, I was saying more and more as, as the time went on. Um, and so one, one of the really big things that came up, um, especially when you're having chemo, I, mean, I didn't have any operations so I can't talk about what it's like to have you know, breast cancer or anything like that, 
Um, with me, it was like fighting this invisible enemy because it was in my blood. And so there was this. There were lots of dark nights of the soul, and I think one of the brilliant areas, um, one of the brilliant things about doing the blog was that instead of me writing about how I didn't want to fight these soldiers and should I be accepting or should I be a surrendering, surrendering and what was the difference between that and me instead of just being really enclosed and quiet in a journal I was sharing it with everybody and people were coming back and saying well so what do you think is acceptance and I was saying well you know for me acceptance is is something passive and I'm not a passive person uh, I can't do acceptance, I can't just sit there and say, well, this is my fate. So we talked about various other things on the blog, and eventually I ended up at surrender, because for me that felt like a, a positive thing. I was saying, okay, okay, and for me it was God, you know, I was saying, okay, God, I have this, and presumably you're going to find me and help me, support me in a way through this. But for me it felt like an active thing which I think empowered me it wouldn't for everybody um, obviously everybody has their own ways of dealing with this um, but I was able to get it out and I was able to have massive support from people um, which again you just don't get if you're writing in a little book and then putting it away and it was such a revelation for me it really it got me through the most difficult times um, there were some very nasty parts of the treatment. There were some um, things I had like um, bone marrow biopsies, which were incredibly painful. Um, and there, there was one that that we had, um, there was one particular day when um, we were expecting family to come down and the Macmillan nurse had phoned in the morning and said, well, the team want you to come in because um, they don't know why your, your blood count and your platelets aren't, aren't recovering from the latest treatment. Um, so they want you to come in. Um, for blood tests and so the whole of that day unfolded and I ended up having a bone marrow biopsy um, and instead of feeling sort of really depressed because I knew that I'd got the family coming down we were supposed to be cooking for 11 and we hadn't done the shopping and all this kind of stuff I was saving it in my head and and so I was writing and it really it brought out a whole new side of my personality it was like this real graveyard humour could come out and because I think because I knew that I was I was facing incredibly toxic treatment, which could easily kill me. Because more people die from the toxicity of chemotherapy than actually die from cancer, which is a sobering thought, isn't it? And I knew that my best chance of recovery would be from my attitude and from being able to support my immune system through taking the complementary therapies. Um, and so being able to share all of that and, and actually gain a sense of humour for, for, from it was immensely empowering. And, and that's, that's something that I, I really, really didn't expect. I think something else that came out as well, um, because that was very unexpected, was there was a sense of grief because I knew that I could never go back to the life that I had. I knew that I would be changed and that Stephen would be changed because when you're facing such a serious diagnosis and, and there's this, you know, if I hadn't had the treatment I had, I certainly wouldn't be here now. Um, and that does something, I think, that does something to your mind and you kind of, in a way, you kind of grieve because you know that you can't go back to how you were before. And of course, that grief triggered other grief processes in my life that I hadn't dealt with. And then I discovered from other people who were reading the blog that they also had processes that they hadn't actually dealt with and so we were all kind of we were learning together we were all gradually being pulled along in a way that we didn't expect and we were all growing because we were sharing on such a huge platform if that makes sense um, so through all of this I was um, invited to join um, a group that was set up by Anita Morjani and on Facebook and it's specifically for people who are um, suffering from cancer and for their relatives and also people who are grieving someone they've lost and and on there they really really tell it like it is and the blog but there were people on there who were using the group as their own personal blog and there were some people on there who taught us all huge lessons because reading their progression they they were at a point in their illness where they thought they were going to survive and then they realized that they weren't actually going to survive and the prognosis was very bad 
and you could actually watch somebody progress and become gracious right to the very, very end. And that was, that was something that I just would never have experienced before. It was a two-way process. It was me sharing and it was me learning from other people too. It, it, was, it was the most amazing thing. And, and lose, when you're in a, a close group, like a cancer support group, obviously there's a very high turnover of members, unfortunately. And so there's also a support in grieving the people who've gone before and learning from the way that they have orchestrated their passing. And that was a massive, massive lesson for me. And it still is, because I'm still part of that group. I still keep the blog. And, um, and I think it, it's a, a continual progression. One of the things I was thinking about when I was planning this speech as well is, um, originally it was just going to be called um, blogging as, as part of the soul's journey or as part of the soul's path. Um, and then it occurred to me that actually you think of Facebook, how, however many of you looked at Facebook today, and you will have seen a whole load of things come up of posts of lovely pictures, you know, with a saying from the Buddha or the Dalai Lama or, or you know, love yourself and then you can love other people and when you criticise somebody else, look at you know, all of those things. And you, you see the most unlikely people sharing them. You know, we've got contact with our families and our friends now that we never had before. And you see something come up and it's really spiritual and you think, they shared that, like, you know, can't imagine them reading that kind of a book, <laughs> which is really judgmental, I know. But in the past, they may not have had exposure to those sayings or to that wisdom. And so what, what I suddenly realised I'm seeing is that we have this amazing opportunity now to all grow. We're, we're all making progress. And maybe we don't realise it, actually. It's like we're, we're all on this slightly different journey because we've now got new resources and new tools at our disposal. And, and it was like a, a massive awakening and I, and I just thought, God, you know, I thought it was me having a, um, an amazing journey just by writing on the blog. And now I see that actually everybody's on this journey because anybody who's on a social network is learning the whole time. And, and that, was, that was a real revelation to me. So that was the point of what I wanted to say, really. It's a journey that we're all on, and, um, and I think it's very subtle, and maybe we don't realise it. So, um, I think there's a survival mentality um, where you get to be able to talk about just about anything. Um, and certainly the, the people who I see surviving the best because I don't think anybody can ever really say they're cured because they never know if it's going to come back or not and and the people who I see are the strongest and the surviving the best are the, are the people who have sorted out that that thing about life and death you know because I think if you get a diagnosis for cancer immediately you're really scared and you have to deal with that fear every day it's never gone and so I think the people who survive the best are the ones who have come to terms with that fear and they seem to be immensely calm and spiritual and they just take everything as it comes and, and they're the people that I really look up to. The granted is huge and I mean it's not a, a kind of a deliberate thing it's just a sense of wonder one of the things I learned um, when I was um, especially in hospitals I started exploring mindfulness and um, that is such a hard thing to do uh, because it's, when you're in, we all know any difficult situation you're in, with the, you know, whatever it is, is that you constantly think forward and you think, what if, what if, what if, and you kind of extrapolate out in your mind something that you're sure is going to happen. It's got to unfold this way because it's bound to, you know, and, and your mind is such that usually it's in a negative way. Um, and I think that um, using something like mindfulness. Um, is, is something that helps to keep you centred and helps you to just stay um, in the moment and to not worry about what the future is going to bring. And that might be good and it might be bad, but in this exact moment where you are, you're not worrying about it and you're not expecting either thing. Um, and I personally find that really liberating. I, I slip quite a lot. <laughs> But fortunately, I've got people around me who sort of support me and remind me. Um, and 
and I, I think that's that's a really powerful thing. I, I'm not a you know oh, the sky is blue and the birds are singing kind of person. I, I think it's really important to be honest to what you're feeling, um, and if you're feeling bad and you're having a bad day. Um, or you're depressed about something, then it's fine to talk about it too. You, you don't just cover up everything um, and pretend it's all fine when it's not. You know, you can talk about it and deal with it, hopefully, and then get back to just being grateful that you're alive. I don't think as a day goes by when I don't wake up and think, I'm so grateful to be alive, because I wouldn't be alive now if it wasn't for what I went through. Um, yeah, I mean, the... the the biggest thing, the, the thing that caused the most scene actually in the hospital <coughs> was that I took one vitamin A drop a, a day um, to combat the mouth ulcers that you get. With chemotherapy, after the first dose goes in, you get a disgusting taste in your mouth, um, you start to get ulcers, you start to go off food, um, and Swamiji, who features quite strongly in the book, um, she when I was going in I said well I, there must be some things I can take because she, she's also very good friends with nutritionists and she said listen to your body have the treatment and then listen to your body see what it's telling you and then when you come out you know we'll, we'll discuss what you need um, and the first thing that happened of course was that my mouth started going really horrible so she said okay one drop of vitamin A a day you know and, and so I was taking that and I never had, even through a stem cell transplant, when they had people on morphine drips because their mouths were in such a state, um, because the whole the whole of the GI tract basically gets turned to white goo. Um, sorry. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> But mine didn't, because I was taking one drop of vitamin A a day. And at one stage I had um, three, I had the consultant and two registrars, and they kind of hustled the consultant in, and like they, every day, three times a day, they were looking at your mouth, you know. Have well, you got any ulcers? And I, I, said, I really haven't, honestly. I don't need mouthwashes, I haven't got ulcers. Um, and they, they couldn't believe that I didn't have any mouth ulcers. And I said, why have you got people on morphine drips when all they need is one drop of vitamin A a day? This is wrong. You know, this is so simple, it's not rocket science. You know, this isn't some, you know, voodoo thing. This is vitamin A. Um, and so I think one of the doctors said she was going to go across to Nutri Centre and get some drops. And I said, look, just put it on their meds, just give it to them. Don't ask, just give it to them. So that was massive. Um, I also took aloe vera um, because that's, that's brilliant. Um, chemo completely messes up the whole of your stomach and digestive systems. Um, wheatgrass protein is very good because um, it's a very high source of protein um, and it keeps you going when you're not hungry. And you really go off food and everything. Um, I was also having um, whey protein powder. Um, that was really good. That, that helped me a lot. Turmeric is excellent because it reduces inflammation of all kinds. Um, so from I think all the way through, I was taking um, six capsules, and I still take six capsules of turmeric a day. And juicing. Stephen would bring in the most amazing juices to me. Um, there's a, somebody who features very strongly in the book is Dot. Um, a lot of the people in there, until I wrote the book, um, they just had like um, other names um, on the blog. Um, so there was like um, my favourite nurse, my unfavourite nurse, my lovely consultant. Because I didn't know if I could give them names at that point. Because um, I didn't know it was going to be a book. Um, but Dot was Dot right from the beginning, and she was just just an incredible little woman. She's about this high, she's about this wide, and she rides a motorbike, and she's must be approaching retirement age. And she rules the boards like with a I used to say with a metal fist in a metal glove, which is a bit cruel. But um, you know she's very very assertive, um, and she let me have a space in her fridge. And when I was in isolation, I had my own space, my, my own fridge in my room um, but when I was on the ward I was given access to the fridge which was like a massive massive um, honour and so Stephen would bring in um, these um, Tupperware t pots of various combinations of, of things um, it was usually beetroot, carrot, cabbage, apple juice, no it wasn't apple juice was it, um, uh, carrots, lots and lots and lots of carrots in there too and of course they made a sort of a purpley sludgy colour so she'd 
next time she'd appear, I'd say, you know, can you put this in the fridge for me? So she put my sticker on it, you know, my hospital thing in, and sort of walk along with it like this, you know, so, oh, what's in that? And, and of course, when I used to go and get it out, because I was allowed to go in there, um, you know, I'd, I'd sort of get it out of the fridge and everything, there'd be like a space cleared around it as if it would contaminate something else. So, but that was, that was a massive strength. That's a short answer. <laughs> And that was really nice. Some hospitals, they have funding um, for aromatherapists and reflexologists to come in. And unfortunately, at Bournemouth, they've withdrawn the funding. So um, the nurses all wanted me to have it. And they knew the benefit of it. The nursing staff knew the benefit of it. Um, but um, I had to pay for it myself. I had, they helped me book it. And then we got her in. And that was lovely and a lot of space for meditation as well because the hospital routine isn't really geared for getting people better um, you're woken up, it starts at five in the morning with the water being brought round and then six o'clock for blood pressure and checks and, and then seven o'clock for the cup of tea you don't want and then at eight o'clock you get uh, the breakfast that you don't want and at nine o'clock it's ward rounds there's just, you know, and it's just ongoing and I was getting really debilitated by it because I need a lot of my own space. I, I can cope with being with people for a while, but then I just want to retreat to like the padded cell. Um, and one of the nurses, who's my favourite nurse, who's actually known me and I could name her finally <laughs> um, in the book, um, she, she, came, she said, this is ridiculous. And, and she came in with a big piece of paper saying, do not disturb, and gave me some blue tack. And she said, just put it on the wall, you know, put it on the door when I was in isolation you know, whenever you want it. So it was fantastic. So if I needed to meditate or chant or anything, I could just put it up on the door and, and they honoured it. It was brilliant because we, we don't get any space for recovery in hospital. You don't get any time. We were talking about this downstairs, actually, because I haven't given a talk before. Um, and up until about two minutes before I started I was feeling quite calm um, but I think when you're signing you have to sign a, like um, a permission um, thing don't you for, for when you have um, serious, for anything actually almost give you a plaster you've got to sign for it um, and and for things you know side effects for the chemo side effects were death heart failure kidney failure lung failure and so it went on. I mean, it was just laughable. And I said, well, what's the point in me signing this? But you have to. And, and I was saying, when you've, when you've signed for treatment like that, and you've actually watched the poison and the toxins going into your body, almost everything else kind of goes down a few, you know? It goes down to like DEFCON 2. And it, the things that used to be really incredibly important you just start thinking actually that isn't really what's important what's important is that I can wake up every day and that I've got people around me that I love yeah and a huge respect for people who who get through treatment yeah thank you